Today, I'm talking about a difficult topic, obstetric violence. I'm going to talk about what that means and why I've put off talking about it for a while. So let's get started. Hey everyone, Dr. Jennifer Lincoln here, board certified OBGYN author and social media educator. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. I do wanna let you know that today's YouTube video is a tough one. And so if you have a history of any trauma around your birth or any trauma at all, I want you to really think about watching this video. And if you choose to watch it and along the way you're finding yourself struggling, it's okay to shut it off. You do not need to watch it. So pay attention to that. And before I get started, go ahead and subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss any of my uploads. Today, I'm talking about obstetric violence. And if when you hear that word, if it's the first time you've heard it, you go, wow, that sounds intense. That's how I felt when I first heard the term as well. First, the reason why I'm talking about this. A while ago, I posted a TikTok about five things that were routine that shouldn't be anymore. And these were things like being shaved before a vaginal delivery, routine enemas, routine episiotomies, things like that. Things that have no place in my practice or the practices of the people that I work very closely with every day. And what really bothered me was that there were a lot of comments from people saying, Oh, that's absolutely still routine. And I was told I had to be shaved before I gave birth. And a lot of these comments were from outside the United States, which still bothers me. But I think what bothered me maybe even a little more was that there were a good number of people who were in the U.S. And the reason I say that bothers me more is because all OBGYNs, we should be practicing under the same set of best practices and also all certified nurse midwives. What I'm talking about today is, is for everybody and it bothers me. And so that's where some people drop the comment, you know, this is obstetric violence. Other posts that I've had where I've done simulations where my birthing model is on her back. She has no legs, like it's literally made to be that way. People have said that that's obstetric violence that she's delivering on her back. And I just found myself hearing that term and going, Ugh, like, whatever, I'm a good doctor. I don't do that. And I realized that, you know, this term would come up every now and again, and I was just pushing it away. I didn't want to talk about it, really, because I feel that I'm a very good OBGYN. And I don't say that I'm not, you know, I'm not learning every day. I still learn every day, and I always have room to improve. And I'm always learning from my patients and the people I work with. But I pride myself on how I treat my patients and the people I work with are amazing too. And I, maybe I'm in a bubble because I work in a system that prides itself on treating birthing people like they should be. Again, always saying we have room to improve. And so I got to thinking, you know, the first time I heard the term white privilege, I had that same reaction of like, oh, I don't have that. And I totally do. And so this is an opportunity I realized for me to learn and I wanted to talk about it with you all because if it's a term you haven't heard, it's a very triggering term, right? Obstetric violence, Oh, And so you just go, ah, whatever, I'm a good person. No, we need to talk about it. So that's what we're doing today. So the first thing I did when I was doing some research for this video was looking up like what's the definition of obstetric violence. And interestingly, when I go on the American College of OBGYN website, when I type in the term obstetric violence into the search bar, only one term comes up. And that's, I say that's interesting because that is a wealth of information. That website, it, you know, covers a lot of journals and their own documents. And it only came up one time. And what you can see here, I'll read it to you. What they say is the definition of the term obstetric violence. The term obstetric violence is a non-medical term that has been used to refer to situations in which a pregnant or postpartum individual experiences disrespect, indignity, or abuse from healthcare practitioners or systems that can stem from and lead to the loss of autonomy. I think that's a really good definition of what it is actually. And they go on to say more subtle manifestations may include minimization of patient symptoms and differential treatment based on race, substance use, or other characteristics. I think that really encompasses what it is. Now you might hear that and go, gosh, that sounds so different than what I think of obstetric violence. And I think that's because the term, from what I've read, this term really originated in Latin American countries where people who were birthing were subject to very harsh conditions and still can be, and this is really worldwide. And so that term was really, I think, meant to make people stop in their tracks. It is a very broad term. I'm not sure if I love the way ACOG says it's a non-medical term because when we do that, we make it sound like maybe it's not real. And the way that we first go about fixing things is identifying them and giving them a name. So I'd love to see that 
maybe changed. And this is from the Make Birth Better website, which I really think is a good website. I haven't delved into all of it, but from what I have read, I've liked what I've seen. And I like how they say the word obstetric violence is more closely aligned with the school of thought that defines a violence in terms of violation. And I think when we think of it that way, we are more likely to accept that definition, see what it means and see what's going on, how we need to, to fix things. Basically, what they say is it's like treating a woman like an object rather than a person, treating a birthing person like an object rather than a person. That is the crux of it. And I think it's really important that we very clearly make clear what this is because I do think the term can be a little murky. It's also for me like the when I first heard the term defund the police, I first heard that and thought, wait a minute, we need law enforcement in, in some degree. I agree it needs to be revamped. But when I heard that term, I automatically said that doesn't make any sense. And so the same thing with obstetric violence. I'm not here to argue what we should or shouldn't call it, but just understanding that sometimes if we don't get what it means right away and we just put it in the back, well, then we're not really going to necessarily be out there saying we need to, to change things. So clearing that up, maybe making this more of a universal term or, or, you know, calling it obstetric violation. I don't know, but we need to talk about it. And here's why we need to talk about this because it's real and sometimes seeing is believing. And so I want to share this YouTube video with you from Amnesty International. This can be hard to watch. This is not real. It's actors, but this is what people are talking about when they talk about obstetric violence. So let's watch it together. And if you need to not watch this section, I totally get it. So we have a pregnant person here. This is about statistics in Uruguay, but we can extrapolate this everywhere. Let's just stop right there. Wow, when I saw that, I like wanted to throw up a little bit in my mouth. Um, but in reports from the World Health Organization and from other organizations fighting obstetric violence, these are things that are said to people, um, sometimes not uncommonly. How dare you talk to somebody who is in labor in pain that way and to degrade her to the fact that because she had sex, she's quote unquote asking for this. That, um, that, so when I see things like that, I think, well, I never do that. I never do that. Nobody I know does that, but people out there do. And so that's why we need to talk about it. Let's watch some more. And just keep your eyes out for things that you're seeing that you're like, okay, that's not okay. That's not okay. Nice doctor, huh? Did you see any consent happening there? And another person? Okay. So let's stop there. I'm not saying that sometimes people don't need multiple exams. Sometimes they do. But did you ever see any consent happening? Or like, why do three men who just silently walk up to her and assume they can examine her think it's okay? Obstetric violence. <laughs> No consent. Cooperate, Deary. Nothing routine. That, um, yeah, all of that. So no communication, um, minimizing of symptoms, nothing, nothing, it's routine. Okay. So they're talking about hooking up Pitocin to get contractions going, which they never got consent for. Stay there quietly. Do you want to lose your baby? So because she's not being quiet and submissive and wants to move, her nurse is saying, well, your baby could die. It's disgusting. Did you ever go to birth class? 
she's exhausted, saying she can't go on anymore. Let's prepare her for surgery. She's saying no, and yet they're taking her to go do a C-section. Because she's probably done with this. Do you see any consent there? Does that disturb you as much as it disturbs me? Um, yeah, and there are people out there that practice this way, that treat birthing people like this every day. And so that's why we're talking about it. So you saw a lot of the examples of what obstetric violence would be considered um, here in this horrible video, right? No support, telling her to stay there quietly, minimizing her symptoms, multiple vaginal exams, no consent for a C-section, no consent for Pitocin. She's on her back and birthing on your back is not bad if that's what the patient wants. But I'm doubting they asked her how she wanted to give birth. So any kind of intervention that is done unnecessarily just because a doctor has to go home or a midwife has other patients she needs to go deliver. The threatening that your baby will die. I can tell you one time in my career, and I've been doing this for 14 years, one time that I've had to say to a mother, I'm concerned your baby is dying. One time. And it, because it was true, <laughs> and I still didn't say it in a way like that. But so threatening, it is okay to say things that you're concerned about when they're happening and there's a true concern, but using it as a way to coerce people who are in labor to do something, that is not okay. The humiliation, the lack of privacy, people coming and going, people staring at her. There are going to be times if you're giving birth where there might feel like there are a lot of people in the room. I can think of one example might be if you're having twins. You know, we did a set of pediatric teams for, for both babies, but we have that discussion ahead of time. We say, hey, there's gonna be some extra people here. We introduce them, you know your name. It's, it feels like a partnership as opposed to people just staring down. That's humiliating. And things that I talked about in the beginning of this video, so forced shaving, for which there's no evidence, routine episiotomies, for which the American College of OBGYN says we're not supposed to do, I have done some of them and they've had indications and I've gotten consent before them because it's actually not that hard to get consent in a short amount of time. And things like routine enemas, these are not indicated. And I'm sure you can think of some other examples that I haven't mentioned here. So go ahead and drop them in the comments if you can think of some examples of obstetric violence that I have not discussed. So in the world, people are realizing this is an issue and the World Health Organization has put out a statement called the prevention and elimination of disrespect and abuse during facility-based childbirth, meaning in hospitals, in birth centers. It's a really excellent resource and a really quick read, and I'm going to link it down below so you can check it out. And I think if you're somebody who works on a labor and delivery unit, it would be great to print this out or maybe to have this as part of some sort of education for nurses, for doctors, for midwives, for anybody who's involved in the birth experience. And what this document basically says is that this happens around the world and this is not okay, this violates basic human rights and that we need to do better. And for people who come to facilities like a hospital to give birth, deserve to be treated with autonomy and respect. And just because they're pregnant does not mean that they are not able to make decisions. Why do we think obstetric violence happens? Well, let's be real. There is a power differential between somebody who's in labor and the people caring for her or for them. Meaning that when somebody is in pain, when somebody's in labor, they're vulnerable. They are in a state, having done it myself twice, once with an epidural and once unmedicated, you can't necessarily communicate in the same way that you can when you are not in labor. And so what can take over is this paternalistic attitude heightened by the fact that when obstetrics became a specialty, it was a male dominated specialty. We are now closer to more equity in terms of gender in providers, but there still can be that paternalistic viewpoint that can permeate the relationship. There's also the historical ignoring of traditionally labeled female issues relating to periods, pain with periods, pain with childbirth, like you saw in the video. Well, you spread your legs, you asked for this, so deal with it. Nice, real nice. So I wanna talk about what you can do as somebody who's preparing to give birth if you've watched this far, because I don't want you to leave this video feeling hopeless, because there are things that you can do to keep your power where it belongs with you. So the first thing is awareness. You know that it's out there, it has a name. When you can name it, you can identify it and say, I will not put up with that. The second thing is to be educated. Again, you're doing that. There is a balance between education and taking in so much information that you feel overwhelmed or anxious. So it's about hitting the sweet spot. The third thing is that you can communicate with your providers. And don't wait until you show up in labor and delivery, five centimeters dilated. Talk about it now. Talk about it now with your midwives, with your doctors. Ask your friends who've given birth at the hospital that you might be planning to go to what their experience was like. 
The bottom line is that you can tell a lot by how somebody reacts. Let's say you're talking to your midwife and saying, hey, I've just learned about this term called obstetric violence where you know, people giving birth are not respected or they're not given choices. Can you tell me what your experience is with that and how that won't happen to me? You can tell right then and there about their reaction, about what it's going to be like. Because if they laugh and go, oh, that doesn't happen here, kind of like my initial internal reaction, because it doesn't happen with me, but my reaction now would be very different. It would be, I know, I'm so aware of that, and it shocks me how some people are treated in labor. Here are the things that we do that are different. Da, da, da. And then you can know. And if you don't get that vibe, it's time to switch. <laughs> when you show up in labor, it can be great to have a support person or an advocate, whether that's your partner, whether that's a doula, somebody who knows what your desires are, a birth preference plan. Birth preferences are great because it can also help communicate your wants and needs when you might not be able to verbalize them yourself with understanding that sometimes things change, but you've got these people and you've got all these layers that are there to help communicate what you want. It is also okay to be blunt. If somebody walks in and treats you disrespectfully, call it out and say, I don't want that doctor back in here. She was very disrespectful. She did not listen to me and did not make me feel safe. Understanding that sometimes there are emergencies, sometimes other people aren't available, which is why it's great to get this figured out when you are in your prenatal care. But if we are able to make these accommodations while you're in labor, we can do that. I do wanna call out that this has nothing to do about men versus women when it comes to providers. We have seen that people who are managing labor, whether they're males or females, can both treat people this way. And so it's not just that men treat women in labor horribly and female doctors do a great job. It has nothing to do with that. And I know a ton of male OBGYNs and even male midwives who are fantastic. And I've also worked with some female ones who are not fantastic. So it has nothing to do with their gender. It is okay to go up the chain. If you feel like you're not being listened to, to ask for the manager, the medical advisor, the patient advocate, there are people leveled up that you can speak to even when you're in active labor. And lastly, I want you to go with your gut. If something doesn't feel right, speak up because you deserve the kind of birth that is respectful and that is what you have envisioned. And it is okay to do that. As women, we are traditionally told that we're supposed to be quiet and to not make noise and not take up space. Screw that, your birth, you get to decide. Now you might say, this, I should not have to do any of this. It's you people who need to work on these things. And you are right. You are absolutely right. And that's what I'm talking about next. But I still wanna give you tools to empower yourself in the meantime. But I 100,000 million infinity percent agree. Okay, things that we need to do. And I'm talking to nurses, to doctors, to midwives, to surgical scrub techs, to anybody who touches a pregnant person. Treat them like you would want to be treated. Sounds so basic. It's the rules of kindergarten. But we forget. We forget explaining things because they're routine to us every day. We need to stop and explain. We need to stop threatening people that terrible things are going to happen unless they do it the way that we want to. And save that for one that's really true. Because when it's really true, I get it. That's okay to communicate it. And you can still do it in a respectful way. But don't act like everything's doomsday because then everybody's pretty soon is going to see that you're, you know, the whatever, the person who cried wolf. You need to respect patient autonomy. And ACOG is very clear about this, about informed, shared decision-making, which means that we might have our ideas of what are best. We can give all the information, the risks, the benefits, alternatives. And at the end of the day, the pregnant person gets to make the choice. Even when it comes to their baby, even if it might be something that we think is harmful, you cannot force somebody into a C-section. And yes, there are cases where people have been told that, where they've gotten orders from judges, and this is ridiculous. And again, read the read the information that I include down below from ACOG on shared decision-making and informed consent. But we need to respect patient autonomy, even if it doesn't align with us, even if it doesn't align with our personal sets of beliefs or values. We need to choose our words wisely. When we say things like failure to progress, failed VBAC, they have a lot of emotion with it. So just choose your words very wisely when talking to somebody who is in a very vulnerable state. Understand and acknowledge the inequities and the power balances between you know, doctor and patient, between white male doctor and black patient between affluent white English speaking midwife and teenage Hispanic low socioeconomic status female patients. So, I mean, there's, there can be so many ways that there can be power balances and we need to acknowledge them and find a way to meet our patients where they're at and make them feel comfortable with us. I think this is a really important one. We need to stop treating labor and delivery like a baby factory. Again, I don't think I do this, but a part of me has normalized being on labor and delivery and birth, right? This is my whole career. But for the person who's there giving birth, this is the most important day of their lives. And so, yes, people are in the hospital giving birth and that's a personal choice that people can make. But if you've chosen to birth there, we need to understand that L&D is a very different place than other parts of the hospital. 
we should treat it as a place where people can come have their babies and medical care is available if they need it. Don't treat it like a regular operating room or like a med surge unit. This is a very special day and a very special place for people. Understand the vulnerability of birth with invasive exams, with being naked, with positioning, with talking about personal things. That's really vulnerable. And again, it's routine to us, but it's not to them. So understanding that and acknowledging that goes a long way. And lastly, let's really think about how we staff and manage births. I personally believe that certified nurse midwives are birth experts when it comes to low risk birth and people like me should be consultants for high risk or complicated births or when they need an extra set of hands. And I think that it's important that we understand where our expertise lies, that we have nurses in labor and delivery who are supportive of an unmedicated birth and feel comfortable with that. And that all of us work together to give somebody the birth experience that they want. And lastly, if things don't go the way that we wish that they had, that it's okay to acknowledge that and we need to, and to talk about birth trauma and wishing how things had been different, apologizing and owning up to things if that happened and getting people the support they need can be really a key part of getting them on their healing journey. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot when looking into this topic. So once again, I've got my references and resources in the show notes, and I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts. If you want to keep the conversation going, you can follow me on TikTok and Instagram at Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. And I just think this is something we need to talk about more. So let's start that conversation. All right, everybody, stay safe.